Hi, um, I'm Saira Nazario. I work in theory and applications at IBM Quantum. And it's my pleasure to be here with you today and give you a quick overview of where we're going at IBM. So let's start by reminding you of how uh, we realize the value of quantum computing. First and foremost, we need to focus on implementing quantum circuits that solve a classically hard problem. That should be obvious that we want to exploit the polynomial size quantum algorithms to beat the classical um, exponential ones. That problem should be interesting and it should teach us something. It's not just about being able to get an answer, otherwise there's no point doing it. We also need to design or choose quantum circuits that use minimal resources to solve the problem. So circuit optimization techniques are very important. And we will want to tailor the problem and its solution to the physical constraints of the quantum hardware capable to run it with minimal costs in terms of number of qubits and operations. This approach has proven to reduce resources by an order of magnitude, and that reduction is even larger when one considers fault-tolerant implementations. A convenient way um, to classify problems where quantum computing can provide value is to think about them in terms of problems relevant for the natural sciences, those relevant for math applications, and the ones relevant for search and optimization. So the ones relevant for natural sciences fall in the category of quantum simulations that include physics problems, chemistry, and materials discovery. Algebraic problems are relevant for math applications, for example, you know, solving linear systems of equation or differential equations um, for factoring, option pricing in finance, and approaches that are relevant for AI. And finally, um, we have quantum search, and that includes approaches useful to address optimization problems or scenario simulation. Reaching an advantage over state-of-the-art classical methods in any of these problems demands scaling our hardware while maintaining a high enough operation fidelity. And most of you have seen already our roadmap to build and scale our hardware for quantum advantage. Each step of the way is about improving the electronics used to control the precise energy at which the qubit operates, implementing technology to use less lines to measure more qubits in order to help scale the measurement of the states of the qubits, reducing errors like crosstalk that appear as the density of the qubits increase, uh, developing technologies to fit more lines to control the center of the chip, improving the packaging of those chips, reducing the size of the electronic racks and the cost while boosting power performance. All that we need to do while preserving the quality of operations performing the qubits to keep error per operation below 1%. Our target is a 1,000 qubit system by 2023, which we call Condor, large enough to allow investigations of quantum advantage in problems of practical importance, and more importantly, implementation and more in-depth studies of quantum error correction in hardware. So going to a million qubits and beyond requires building new infrastructure, and that's why we designed a larger refrigerator with a million um, qubits in mind, it's six foot wide, 10 foot tall, larger than anything available commercially, and with the capability to separate input and output lines to increase the density of lines that can go in. Now beyond a million qubits will probably need to connect fridges in a scalable network of linked quantum processors and use entanglement to implement operations between the processors in different fridges to create a cluster that extends computation power. But going back to Condor, Condor will bring us closer to an important milestone in terms of the scaling of the performance of our devices. We measure computational capability of quantum hardware by its quantum volume which measures the largest computational space that the quantum computer can explore. And we have been consistently doubling it every year. Now, running circuits for quantum advantage in useful problems like those that we mentioned at the beginning, that requires millions of operations or more. And it's a law of nature that anything that is not prohibited is mandatory. So while executing those gazillions of gates, errors will accumulate. So we need error correction to fix that. Now, by allowing us to investigate quantum error correcting codes, Condor will take us closer to an inflection point, a change in the scaling of quantum volume, where if the errors in the operations that we apply to the qubits is small enough, we would transition from progress being limited by errors in the physical operations on the qubits to progress dominated by software and errors in the operation of logical qubits, which are the qubits that are encoded in codes to correct errors. That would be a game changer in terms of capabilities and quantum advantage. 
So let's see how we get there by co-designing error correction with hardware. In going from our first systems to our latest Falcon devices, we changed the underlying topology to a sparser lattice in the shape of a hexagonal ring. The reason is that our systems use fixed frequency qubits where the characteristic properties of the qubits are all set at the time of fabrication. Now that moves the engineering complications away from the delicate qubits and simplify things to benefit scaling to larger devices while maintaining performance. But because of fabrication tolerances, the frequencies may deviate from the um, designed values. And when the connectivity is high, that leads to frequency collisions. We could remove them by applying more microwave controls and increasing the length of two qubit gates, but we want to avoid that because that's not scalable. For 15 to 20 megahertz precision of setting frequencies, going to that hexagonal lattice improves things by an order of magnitude as compared to the square lattice. Faced with the challenge of defining the path to fault-tolerant quantum computing with that lattice arrangement of our devices, our theory team developed a new quantum error correction code called the heavy hexagon code. It is the beginning of our line of research that co-designs the hardware and the error correction, taking the engineering constraints to heart and designing codes to match those constraints. That's why our codes look exactly the same as our processor architectures. The circuits used to correct errors with this code are shown in the left. The plots in the right show results of simulations of the error rates for this code. Once we lower the error rate in the operations applied to our physical qubits to about one in 10,000 operations, then we can use this code to improve the quality of error corrected circuits dramatically and make the errors that come out be a lot less than what comes in. So you see, um, we're working here at the intersection of the devices that we can realistically build in the time frame that we set up, which is very aggressive, and our ability to innovate on error correction. But we're doing more than that. We're simultaneously working from the other direction, um, one where theory informs the hardware that we need in the future. We need to do that because codes that live in a plane and require only nearest neighbors, like the surface code, there's a, there's a whole lot to like about them. But they also require a large amount of resources in terms of physical qubits and gates. And this is because the number of physical qubits that you need to encode logical qubits increases with the code distance square. We need to do better. We need to find ways to be able to do more with less. Therefore, we're exploring a variety of fundamental research projects with the potential to reduce the cost of error correction. That can be done by either connecting distant qubits as opposed to, as opposed to just nearest neighbors or by exploring higher dimensions. And here you have examples of some of the approaches in that spirit that are being pursued by our team at IBM. The goal is to find new ways to correct more with less resources while near term, we extract value from the heavy hex code to drive progress to quantum advantage. And this is an essential part of our strategy. These scalable error corrected circuits will enable us to capitalize on the power of quantum computing. In building and leveraging them, the question to ask then is whether we can identify quantum circuits that are hard to solve classically and do something valuable with them. And following this line of thought, Last year, IBM's Kristen Tam and his collaborators worked from a circuit that we know is hard for a conventional computer to solve and used it for classification of classical data. The key observations are that the only way to make this process non-trivial is to make it hard to evaluate the kernel classically, and that for a quantum computer, estimating that kernel is simple because it is essentially an estimation of the transition amplitude of the circuit as an inner product calculation. Now, we had strong suspicions that this approach to kernels leads to quantum advantage because it starts from a hard circuit. But last year, we didn't have formal proof of that advantage. So the question was, can we find interesting quantum kernels and feature maps for classical data where we could have provable guarantee of a strong quantum advantage for some learning problem? And in fact, recently our algorithm algorithm team posted on the archive a paper where they identified a quantum feature map and circuit for kernel estimation with a formal proof of advantage over all possible binary classical classifiers. You can find the details in the archive reference in the slide. It's a very important result because it proves that quantum kernels exist that provide a super polynomial quantum speedot for classification of classical data. And you do not need QRAM or anything like that only access to the classical data. 
Now, I've been telling you about how we use hard quantum circuits to solve um, the problems um, of scientific and business importance and how we're working towards the development of hardware implementations of ever better quantum error correction. But you might be wondering, okay, so what can that allow me to do? I like, what do I need to solve practical problems and gain a quantum advantage over state-of-the-art classical methods? To answer that, let's look at examples in those three categories of problems that I mentioned at the beginning, quantum simulations, algebraic problems, and quantum search. Starting with a well-known algebraic problem, the largest in integer number that has been factored classically is a 795-bit number. A quantum computer that achieves that requires a couple of thousand qubits capable of executing a bit over 100 million gates. Now that translates into an error per operation lower than one in a billion to bit classical. Factoring a 2048 bit number requires about an order of magnitude lower uh, error rate. So we need um, quantum error correction to take us to this level once we get to about an error in 10,000 operations and physical devices. When quantum mechanics was originally proposed as a model of computation, it was thinking about simulating the quantum mechanical aspects of nature. Quantum simulation was its original value proposition, and it remains one of the biggest hopes for this um, computing paradigm. Simulating catalysis, in particular simulating the cofactor of the enzyme that catalyzes the reduction of nitrogen to ammonia in the production of fertilizer, that has been attempted classically ab initio. And to give you an idea of what's possible classically, simulating 24 electrons in 24 orbitals using 200 configuration interaction iterations um, and using slightly over 8,000 processors requires over 100 days. Attempts to go beyond that using classical methods have failed to converge and give good accuracy. Now, a quantum computer can solve this process and estimate the energy to 1 millihertz accuracy using a few thousand qubits capable of executing about 30 billion gates. If one assumes the gates to take 10 microseconds, that simulation would take less than a week. If you want to use less qubit, you have to pay in the cost in number of gates. Nothing is free. A bit over 100 qubits increases the number of gates to almost a quadrillion before the qubits go here. But there are important condensed matter physics problems like that, like that of high um, temperature superconductivity, which is conduction of electricity with ultra low loss. Um, and this has less stringent requirements. In this case, a quantum computer with about 83 qubits capable of running about 45 million gates outperforms state-of-the-art classical simulations. And for the Heisenberg model, which describes almost all magnets, you can reach quantum advantage with about 70 qubits executing less than 7 million gates. We are working on new algorithmic developments on more efficient error correction and powerful circuit optimizations to be able to lower those requirements. And of course, parallelization in multiple quantum processors can lower runtime too. Now, together with our partners, you know, our collaborators, with our Q network members, we're exploring optimal ways to represent problems because the choice of the representation affects the simulation cost. Um, how to best, best simulate thermal states for the discovery of materials and control of chemical reactions. We're investigating time evolution algorithms and better ways to find correlation functions for materials discovery. How to optimize uh, quantum simulation algorithms for problems of business value. And this involves accurate estimation of the resources that are required to solve those problems, which in turn means studying the space-time trade-offs of the quantum circuits. We're developing better compilers and think synthesis of circuits that reduce their cost. How to improve the implementation um, of uh, fundamental algorithmic primitives. Um, for example, quantum phase um, estimation enables high precision measurements of energy levels in materials. And implementing it by the iterative method reduces the resource cost. And we're also developing with them ways to scale quantum simulations to larger problem sizes by trading off quantum and classical resources, and you will see more on this from us in the coming months. And I'm only scratching the surface here. We saw examples of the requirements for value proposition in quantum simulations and algebraic problems. So consider now um, one example in the third category. 
the quantum amplitude estimation algorithm can be used to approximate the expected value of a random variable and thus apply to the problem of analyzing risk and pricing securities. And it was shown that the, our team showed that it does so quadratically more efficiently than the Monte Carlo simulations that people use to calculate these things. So you need only a few thousand samples to calculate what would take a classical computer millions of samples. Value at risk is an example of these metrics. It quantifies the level of financial risks that you have in your portfolio over some period of time. Say that you wanted to calculate the 99.9% .9 value at risk of a portfolio of a million assets, so you have 0.1% chance of experiencing undesired losses. That computation would require about a million qubits able to do 10 million gates to be in the range of what's impossible or what is very hard classically. Now, with these examples, I wanted to give you a sense of the trade-offs. I'm summarizing them here, and you see how we go between two extremes. In quantum simulations, some condensed matter physics problems are cheapest in terms of numbers of qubits and gates overall. If you make quantum chemistry cheap in qubits, it tends to be very expensive in terms of gates, or you trade off gates for qubits. Quantum search is cheap in terms of gates, but expensive in numbers of qubits, and algebraic problems fall in between. There may be exceptions, but this gives you an idea of the requirements to solve problems of industry relevance and the skills or classical methods fail. And to give you an idea of the rate of progress towards being able to address problems like that, 10 years ago, we had only one or two qubits and we could only do a single gate. Today, we have 65 qubits, we're expecting 127 next year, and we can do around 1,000 gates. So we advanced by orders of magnitude in the last 10 years, and we expect to continue or even accelerate that. So let me give you an example now of uh, the vibrancy of the community and how they're using all this. An example of our team producing a result and the community in the Q-Network leveraging it and improving upon it. After IBM published our first paper on quantum risk analysis, our colleagues at Keio University and their collaborators at Mitsuho Financial, um, Mitsubishi Financial Group and Mitsuho um, found a way to improve their resources. They developed an algorithm that only requires to run the lower part on a quantum computer and replaces the rest by a maximum likelihood estimation. This leads to a significant simplification of the quantum circuits in terms of the required numbers of qubits and the circuit depth. That algorithm is heuristic, and the maximum likelihood estimation part gets numerically challenging for increasing accuracy. A few months later, Scott Aronson and Patrick Roll show that it is possible to achieve comparable circuit reduction combined with a rigorous theory. But that came at the cost of very large constants. So to improve and make it more practical, you want to find ways to avoid large constants. And based on those two results, uh, the team at IBM Zurich then developed an algorithm that leads to the simplified circuits, has a rigorous convergence theory, performs as good or better than the others, and does not involve any numerically challenging steps. Those algorithms were implemented in Qiskit and compared on a simple problem, just a fair coin, and showing that the iterative algorithm is as good as the maximum likelihood amplitude estimation, and both not only simplify the circuits involved, but also lead to a better performance than the canonical quantum um, amplitude estimation algorithm. Later on, JP Morgan Chase, working with us, used these results together with error mitigation to price a European call option in one of our devices. So this story, from the first quantum risk analysis paper to the improvements made by KO to JPMC taking it and adding error mitigation for their demonstration, shows how everything comes together and the value of a strong community building on top of each other to drive progress. And I'll leave you um, with a few thoughts on what you should consider as you evaluate quantum computing technologies. We like to think of circuits as the currency of quantum, and it's important to focus on three critical aspects. The quality of circuits, how well can the hardware implement quantum circuits, and we measure this by quantum volume. The variety and type of circuits that you can implement on the hardware. And for this, understanding the complexity of the circuits is very important, and how to integrate them in applications. We bring you that variety through open chasm and Qiskit. The capacity of hardware to run circuits, how fast can they run? Consider that you know, a problem in quantum chemistry with error mitigation requires executing on the order of 
a billion or a few uh, billion quantum circuits or more. And you'll see uh, that being able to do that fast is important considering the number of, of circuits. To speed up that runtime dramatically, we're working on the future hybrid cloud quantum integration. And um, Blake will talk about that and tune to his talk right after this at, um, you know, in the demo section. I leave you then with those three words to remember when thinking about quantum computing systems, quality, variety, and capacity of circuits. Thank you.